Welcome to Talks. This is our, uh, our forum, our Distinguished Speaker Forum that happens every week while school's in session. However, after the next week's uh, talk about uh, space uh, exploration business or something, we take a break for most of the summer just because people like to get outside, I think. Um, and uh, it goes until about uh, 2.25. Uh, we then go out into the hallway and you get to meet the speaker and have some cookies and sodas and stuff. Online, there are people that will listen to anything that you say from your desks if you push the uh, front of that black object in front of you and see the green light turn on. So that's a good thing to do when you want to ask a question, is uh, see that, red, that green light turn on as you push that. Um, and uh, so today we have uh, uh, Merrick uh, Mikulowski, uh, and he's a very exciting uh, roboticist, a PhD out of CMU of all places, um, who has uh, built a company based on a collaboration he had with a Japanese roboticist. And uh, they sell in Toys R Us. Uh, and he's been having a lot of fun selling, uh, as I understand it, uh, over 100,000 of these things in the, last, uh, in the last six months. Is that about right? And uh, it's really kind of fun to hear the journey, but also think about, uh, think about uh, both uh, the entrepreneurial aspects and the technical aspects and the social aspects. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and um, yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Selker, and thanks everybody for coming. And uh, everybody out on the web or in the future watching the recording. Uh, my name's Marek, and um, yeah, I was at Carnegie Mellon until uh, 2010, Carnegie Mellon East, sorry. And uh, <laughs> now I am, as of, as of just about six months ago, uh, up in San Francisco. So. Uh, it's a very, very short, short trip for me today, but uh, I'll be talking to you mostly about this, this character and robot known as Keep On, uh, which is probably our, our most famous, famous design. But I just wanted to start by kind of motivating what, what we're trying to do, and that's to create socially interactive robotics. And that problem is. Um, one that we can think about in many different ways. Uh, but certainly one, one very compelling way to think about it is that what we're trying to do is create an illusion of life. And uh, people, some, a, a group of people who are very good at creating that kind of illusion of life are animators. And of course, we're all very familiar with, uh, with what Disney has done for animation over the past 100 years um, in uh, Allowing allowing creative people to uh, to build character, not only to build character, but to build uh, entities that we we feel emotional connections to, that we can maybe build relationships with, and I think that's um, that's something that that has in, sort of inspired me over the past few years, moving from uh, computer science through um, studying artificial intelligence and then getting into robotics. Those uh, those principles of animation that were sort of originally codified by the by the Disney animators were updated more recently by by John Lasseter and um, a whole community of uh, of computer animators. And I see robotics as perhaps a, a kind of continuation of the the evolution of the tools that we have um, to. To create to create such characters from from just drawing drawing frames and presenting them sequentially to actually modeling uh, these characters and and animating them to now be you know being able to physically create uh, real real robotic characters the the principles that 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 these animators uh, have have given us are uh, very interesting, and, and I, I definitely encourage you to, to look up at least Lassiter's paper that gives a, a nice summary of, of these principles, if not the full uh, Disney uh, treatment of them. But uh, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but a lot of these principles have direct application to the design of robots. For example, uh, this, th this principle of slow in and out uh, has, a, has a direct application to how, to, how we control motors. 
Um, we we want to start them slowly, have them move, uh, and then and then slow them down at the end at the end of a trajectory. And and this is something that that you know, we're doing we're doing uh, on the keep on robot. And of course that's that's for being friendly to the motors and the and the mechanisms. But it's also uh, attractive when we see that kind of movement because that's how living living beings with their with their muscles tend to move. But Animation also kind of has its limits in, in how it can inform robot design because animation is pre-made and consumed, whereas what we're creating needs to be uh, interactive, and an interaction is, by definition, co-created by the two partners and its experience. So perhaps something that we, uh, or another area that we can look at for, for inspiration is, is puppetry or, or costumes that, that we uh, we dress up uh, and and engage with people as di a different character and and there's uh, there's something that can be a lot of fun about this. Of course, it's it's a part of almost all all human cultures. Uh, but there's also something I think what's very interesting about this kind of interaction is that there's something slightly unnerving and and um, odd about it. And and I. I see that same uh, oddness in in a lot of our the, the interactions we see uh, with with robots over the past the past few decades, and this is kind of a, a nice example of uh, a really unnatural interaction. You don't shake somebody's hand while looking at somebody else, um, and and you know so why why does this happen? Well, we're we're not very good at, at building robots. That that convey um, a that, that that illusion of life, perhaps. Um, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> um, but there's also maybe a, a kind of burden of of science fiction that that um, we've been we've all been raised uh, on cultural products that that teach us that that uh, robots. And our relationship with robots is, is going to be a certain way, and and often that, uh, that there's there's a lot of negativity there, um, and and so th that's that's something that we we also definitely need to uh, deal with as we're as we're designing these robots that we we have certain notions of what they need to look like and and the kinds of relationships we need to have with them. Someone who has run up uh, directly against that that kind of burden of science fiction is my. Partner in in Japan is Dr. Hideki Kojima. He is uh, currently a professor at Miyagi University in Sendai. And many years ago, he was uh, working on this the robot on the left uh, called Infinoid. And and he'll he'll probably be the first to admit that he you know he as as well as his his um, all his his peers his his roboticist peers in Japan are have have spent their lives kind of trying to build Astro Boy, and and Astro Boy is this very strong um, cultural presence in in the Japanese consciousness since World War II, and you can you can certainly see how in, Infinoid is, um, I think at least one of one of the best kind of uh, <laughs> approximations of of what uh, what a real life Astro Boy might be. Uh, he was using this robot to study various uh, linguistic theories of um, word learning, as well as nonverbal interactive cues, such as uh, eye contact jo and joint attention. So the, this is a very open-ended interaction in which the robot is actually listening to his speech and, and trying to figure out what are the salient objects in the environment and building uh, mappings between between the speech and the visual visual uh, stimuli. He, yeah? Is this kind of uh, coincident timeways with Kismet and uh, what? Yeah, so, so Dr. Kojima had been at MIT Working with Rod Brooks and Cynthia Brazil and Brian Scazzolati uh, for a year, I believe, and after coming back, he uh, he built he built this robot. 
he was also doing, uh, he was looking at a lot of interactions between this robot and children, uh, particularly those with autism. And now autism is, is very interesting for social roboticists, uh, both because by looking at, at people who are missing certain social abilities, uh, that can be informative in, in teaching us what it is that we're actually trying to build into our social robots. And secondly, that, that there seems to be uh, a, a lot of evidence that, that children with autism can perhaps be even more interested or engaged with robotic devices than, than with people in some cases. And so there's, there's the, these, t these two reasons that uh, you, end up, you end up seeing social robotics and, and autism crossing paths very often. But in, in consulting with, uh, with ther autism therapists about why children were, were really uh, uh, intimidated or afraid of this robot in many cases, they, they suggested that he create something uh, extremely minimal and simple. And so he sort of design-wise went, went 180 degrees and created this, this very simple, simple character that has but a body, a head, two eyes, and a nose. Um, originally, his, his, his first design even had a mouth, which he ended up removing because if it doesn't speak, and we, it, it was not to, to speak or make facial expressions to try to be as simple as possible, uh, it shouldn't have a mouth. It shouldn't create an expectation that it can do something that it actually can't. Um, so besides the physical simplicity of keep on, the behavioral, sim the, the behavioral repertoire is actually uh, rather rather limited by design as well. Um, it has four degrees of freedom, so it can turn left and right, look up, look up and down, so you get your pan tilt um, for mm -hmm. directing attention. And additionally, you have uh, leaning side to side and bouncing uh, behaviors that allow for some very simple emotional behaviors. Um, now, if uh, you'll just bear with me, I, I need to stop screen sharing for just a second. Um, the the video I'm about to show is as uh, is in a clinical setting with privacy constraints. I think that's uh, that's good. So this is a video of an example interaction between Keepon and some children with autism in, in a playroom setting. Now, Keepon is being brought in every week for a few hours uh, to this special school where there's about a dozen children with their parents and therapists there. And they're really just encouraged to, to, uh, to play, not in any particular way or with anything specifically. But we see very inter in interesting interactions emerge in that setting with Keepon. And this is the, the view from the cameras in his eyes, he also has a microphone in his nose that allows a therapist in the next room to, to operate the robot. So in, in all of these clinical settings, the intelligence of the robot is that of a human therapist who's, who's trying to identify things that children are doing and to respond to them in, um, in an appropriate way. Um, so I'll just play that this for you. So the girl, the girl in the middle, um, he has uh, has autism. She's, I think, about four years old, and you can see in the initially in the, um, the course of these interactions, she's rather uh, curious about the robot, but still apprehensive and hesitant this to approach. Sorry about the video. Coding, but there's uh, a demonstration by the therapist of ways to play with with keep on, and, and um, she uses the the presence of the therapist as kind of safety. And you saw that she was actually bringing the adult with her, um, but at some point she becomes uh, comfortable enough to approach very closely, and uh, and touch the robot, and you'll see after this, after this first touch, a uh, sense on her face of, of satisfaction and relief that everything's okay. And in reviewing these videos, the therapist considered that moment to have been a kind of breakthrough, uh, because after that, she's uh, she's very comfortable coming right up to keep on making eye contact. 
playing the kinds of, of games, kind of care caregiving um, games that she saw demonstrated earlier. Here she's actually vocalizing towards the robot. It's not linguistic, but it's certainly tender and communicative in nature. Uh, and finally we get a, a kiss. And so that's, uh, that's a really interesting interaction from the perspective of um, a, a doctor or therapist, and it's a very moving interaction from the perspective of the parent. Let me just share the, share the screen again. And so we ask why, uh, why that good interaction happens. Um, and one, one idea is perhaps that autism is not a motivational problem. It's not that the children don't want to be social, but that there's a perceptual difficulty that they're, they're experiencing. Um, if, if most of us are, are equipped with some kind of social filter that takes all of the complicated noise uh, that we project when we interact, and and kind of distills it to a very a simple um, set of attentional and emotional cues. And if that filter is broken, perhaps in autism, uh, there might be a, a sensory overload. And and we we see in in uh, self reports by by people with autism that that a lot of sensory stimuli can actually be. Uh, overwhelming and painful, whether it's light or sound, and perhaps human human social social behavior is is similarly uh, overstimulating to them in this way. So the idea with Keep On is to take take the ther the therapist back a step, give them a uh, mediating interface through which to interact with the child, and since all Keep On exhibits is attention and emotion in a very simplified form. The child's able to understand those cues uh, more easily and is therefore more comfortable approaching and engaging with, with the child. Uh, so so this, is, this is one theory for, for why that happens. Um, and, and the big question, of course, is whether, it, uh, whether the, the good interactions received with the robot transfer to the rest of their lives. And that's the thing that we still can't, can't say, but we're... we're uh, doing research and working with other researchers to try to answer that. Yeah, so Ted again, um, do you have, is there, is there like, you know, uh, an experiment that shows that that actually happens across patients or just as an anecdotal that this is, uh, that they pay more attention to this thing? Uh, so the, we, we have published in, um, in various both robotics and cognitive science and autism uh, journals and conferences. Uh, most most of the the results uh, end up being anecdotal because there's you know a dozen children a year that we can we can work with in this way and uh, and and while you we can we can report statistics for example on on how uh, you know something like average distance to the robot drops over time and how that might uh, you know happen across all the children in in that group. Um, the, the sort of large scale studies that uh, would be needed to, to show a difference between you know a group that's interacting with the robot and or not interacting with the robot is is something that has yet to be done uh, is yet to be done um, so there's there's one other video I would like to show as a point of comparison which unfortunately I also need to stop sharing um, but this is uh, keep on in a uh, normal kindergarten interacting with uh, healthy, healthy three-year-old children, and you see a, a really big difference. There's a lot more interaction between the children using using keep on as the kind of pivot. Um, there's uh, certainly all the, the care caretaking behavior towards the robot when um, 
when his cap is missing. We, of course, see some, some violence uh, towards the robot, and, and it's certainly well, well constructed to be able to handle that kind of abuse. But uh, what's really um, adorable is, is the reaction of the girls to, uh, to the abuse they, they just witnessed. Although it's, it's clear that Keepon doesn't speak, she's still trying to, to teach him words. Uh, Keepon was wearing a band-aid on his head this day. So she's feeding, feeding him medicine. Anyway, uh, so, so that's just that just kind of shows you uh, how you can really see a lot of um, very, uh, very rich and and interesting interactions with uh, such a such a simple social robot. So uh, when I was starting at Carnegie Mellon, I was originally working on the, the Roboceptionist robot there with, uh, with Reed Simmons. And, and um, I, I became interested in the nonverbal non social cues, uh, some of which I started to look at on the Roboceptionist. But uh, eventually, Reed kind of let me spend a lot of time in Japan with, uh, with Dr. Kojima. Uh, pursuing a, a kind of line of research involving involving dance and rhythm, and um, I, part of it was that when I when I first met him and started working with Keepon, I had this feeling that that this guy wanted wanted to dance. I just I felt like there was something in something in its in its character which had not yet been fully realized, and so I wanted to just kind of help help that through, but. I, I was also reading um, some some of the social science work uh, on the the rhythms in interaction, uh, and of course we can we can look more broadly at at human behavior in general and see that that a lot of what we do is periodic and rhythmic, and you know groups like the the whirling dervishes have made entire philosophies around this idea, but if we look at uh, kind of the whole range of, of activity from the creation of art and music to engaging in, in uh, labor as teams um, to, uh, to dancing, to lovemaking, that all of these human um, interactive behaviors are very rhythmic. And uh, in, the, in the 70s, um, William Condon and Adam Kendon started looking at videos of human interaction uh, frame by frame and trying to code them and understand some, some underlying principles of social interaction. And as Condon re re reports it, he sort of uh, in the corner of his eye one day saw something, something happen on one of these frames that at the same time as, as the woman turned her head, the man raised his arm. And, and he, so he started looking for coincidences between um, changes in direction of movement of, of various uh, body parts and accents in the speech signal, and and was he was he was drawing these out on on massive paper charts, but finding uh, these these uh, patterns of uh, um, of movement that 
uh, were not just synchronized within one person, but also synchronized between interacting people. So this was this is very uh, very interesting, of course, and and a very good summary of of all this work is in this uh, also very accessible but entertaining um, book by Edward Hall, the, the Dance of Life. So I recommend that if you're interested. Uh, but my my thought was was that keep on being able to move so quickly and in such a lifelike manner would be a good platform on which to start asking some questions about synchrony between rhythmic synchrony between a, a robot and and a human. And so what I what I ended up looking at was uh, dance interactions between um, children at the at the Carnegie Mellon Children's School and uh, and keep on and set up uh, various experiments in having keep on dance in synchrony either with music that was playing in the environment or with children's movement as perceived using either vision or accelerometers like the Wii remote controller or uh, pressure sensors in the Wii uh, balance board and uh, found, found some, some very interest, various uh, interesting results in terms of, uh, for example, children, children tending to uh, synchronize uh, to a greater degree with the music that was playing if Keep On was also reinforcing that rhythm and, and Keep On was dancing to the music and kind of leading, uh, whereas if Keep On was dancing in, tune, uh, in time with the children, uh, they, they seem to exhibit a higher level of activity, um, a more uh, bigger, bigger movement. And so, so these, were, these were the kinds of, the kinds of studies I, I was doing there. And uh, of course, the, all this rhythmic synchrony um, has, has potentially some application back in the, in the autism uh, research and, th and therapy. Uh, that keep on grew out of. I was able to uh, set up a, a, an interaction with some older children with autism for uh, a Pittsburgh local local news. Um, they wanted to they wanted to just see see these things happening. And uh, what was really interesting is that this this one boy on the left was exhibiting this kind of uh, stereotypical periodic repetitive movement of his hand. Um, and he wasn't really paying attention to the robot, uh, but I, I was controlling. I was controlling Keep On and started to have him dance and bounce in time with the uh, the, the bouncing of, of this boy's hand. And he noticed that and uh, immediately kind of focused focused on the robot and uh, started laughing and and really seemed to. To warm to it, and, and eventually uh, he also kissed it. This was only after about maybe 30 seconds of engaging in in that very simple rhythmic uh, synchrony with it, with his movement. And so, th and this is something that that um, dance therapists uh, do, use use very frequently. That they might sit next to a child who's rocking and just rock at the same frequency, and just that that awareness that this other person in the environment is. Is in time with me um, makes makes me then then open up and, and interact and, and maybe that interaction can be uh, guided in in a more uh, productive direction. A side effect of all this dancing uh, research was uh, a few videos that music videos that we made with Keep On, starting from one that was just three minutes of dancing to a spoon song. That went viral, was featured on the front page of YouTube. Uh, then Wired Magazine invited us to make that video with the band Spoon in Tokyo, and it was pro professional production, a lot of fun. And then at Carnegie Mellon with uh, Dan Wilson, uh, author of Robopocalypse, soon to be a Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, we, did, we did some promo videos for CMU. We did a video in Seoul, Korea, where he danced with some, uh, some traditional dancers. And so this was. Uh, of course, tons of fun and a huge distraction from my PhD, uh, and and something that that uh, that Reed was was very gracious in, in dealing with and, and allowing me to um, to pursue these these tangents, which finally finally whipped me into shape and got me done. Um, but uh, over the course of that, we were just getting a lot of a lot of hugely positive feedback from uh, from the general. Kind of audience, not not 
people with autism or other researchers, but just uh, just people of all ages who were seeing these videos and were uh, entertained by them. Sometimes, you know, were writing me emails that um, that that they they suffer from depression and they watch these videos every morning just to to kind of perk up and and that it helps them and they just wanted to write me to to thank to thank uh, me for for putting those videos online and so that that's that was that was very meaningful um, to get to get all this all this great feedback uh, people were making their own uh, kind of tribute videos with little puppets and masks and uh, and people were recording their children um, dancing dancing to the videos anyway this was great and we were getting requests from uh, toy companies as well to to work on something something together and in the end uh, I ended up uh, working with this British company called Wow Stuff on a on on licensing the character to them for a, a toy version of Keep On and that was called My Keep On um, and it was uh, it came out in Toys R Us last fall and while the toy version uh, doesn't have cameras. It's not controlled by a human being. It's it's autonomous. It's got two modes of interaction. One is uh, response to touch through various touch sensors around the body, and um, dance mode uh, uses the microphone in in Keepon's nose to do uh, beat detection and and dancing to music. Um, the process of of making this toy was was uh, very educational and and uh, at times, certainly frustrating. Lots of constraints, um, cost constraints, process constraints that um, that made us um, kind of really think about what what we could what we could put in and what we had to leave out. Uh, but but definitely an, an interesting process, and uh, ultimately I think a worthwhile one because one of the one of the agreements we had with the toy company was that a certain percentage of the proceeds from the sale of this toy were going to be used to manufacture some of the research versions of Keep On, uh, which we would then donate to to some therapists and, and researchers who uh, who would apply apply for, for the robots. Um, and so we'll be doing that this year. And, and that's a really nice um, outcome in addition to uh, the many people who had been had been asking for a toy and uh, were finally able to get one. The, the launch of the toy was also kind of a big uh, trip. We got to make a, uh, a giant inflatable keep on and, and set it up in, in New York. We had uh, Bloomberg Business Week actually uh, ran an ad campaign around a few stories that they had covered, one of which was, was about the development of the toy. And so this was a full page in um, Atlantic Monthly, Wired, New Yorker. And so it was just... Um, Really, really pretty exciting. This is the Toys R Us in Times Square where we got the inflatable set up, and and Bloomberg also uh, also uh, had their ad up. So you know, in the course of less than a year, we went from two academics with a research robot to to having a, a toy in Toys R Us, and that was um, just really uh, really a lot of fun for both of us. Um, another. Another project that kind of came out of this is that Make Magazine asked us if we would ma do a, uh, a do-it-yourself dancing robot as a kind of educational toolkit for, for kids, something, something that can be done at home along the lines of Keep On. And of course, Keep On is uh, pretty complicated, but um, we, uh, I, well, I was, I was at the time playing with my new maker bot and uh, getting much more into the, into 3D CAD design and fabrication, and I, I, I realized I was having a lot more fun um, playing in SolidWorks or uh, s uh, spending a day in the machine shop and getting uh, cutting oil all over my hands and, and just just walking out at the end of the day with a piece of metal was was really rewarding after uh, a, you know decades of programming at a computer. <laughs> So it was just it was kind of a, a change of um, pace for me, and 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 I wanted to do something that involved uh, all these kind of new tools for very quick prototyping and fabrication, like the MakerBot, 
and the Arduino. And so designed this uh, this very simple simple character that involved all off-the-shelf components, mainly an Arduino and three solenoids, and then a few parts printed on a MakerBot. And that was a uh, little guy called Spotsy. And uh, I've gone to a couple Maker fairs now where there, you know, people people have have built these and are have them on their tables and, and are doing beat detection on the on the computer to their iTunes music and and just have these out and, and dancing, putting new hair styles on them and things like that. So it's really really uh, fun to see um, even kids kind of uh, jazzed about the the ease of, of doing this kind of stuff. Um, let's see another another kind of related project to to the whole rhythmic. Uh, Synchrony thesis, thesis work I was doing was this collaboration with an artist and some other roboticists at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, ben Brown and Garth Zeglin built this uh, performer robot on the left, and I built a, a spectator on the right. Uh, Sue Ann Hong built uh, a, a um, perceptual and machine learning system that allowed this uh, spectator to watch the performance of this performer robot uh, and build a model of that performer's activity and uh, a measure of deviation from that model in, in the performer's future, future behaviors. And the spectator reflected its appreciation of this art through uh, the cheering of the antennae on its head and its pose. And the, the project is really uh, it's about art that's created by and for robots, um, and humans humans are not really invited into this into this setting at all. Um, they're they're behind these screens, and humans can watch uh, videos of this of this interaction happening. Uh, but the idea here was that was that um, there's some there's perhaps a place between total pat uh, predictable pattern and and complete chaos that represents a, a sort of peak of aesthetic appreciation that, that the spectator wants to see something that it can get into, but it also wants to be surprised. And so uh, we, we had a single scalar um, variable that represented aesthetic appreciation. And we certainly offended a lot of artists who came to uh, our openings, one in Helsinki and one in Oslo uh, at, at museums there. Um, and they were just they were just kind of offended that that we presumed to uh, reduce the reduce aesthetic appreciation to a, a kind of single value. And well, we said you know it's a model. If you have a if you have a better one, uh, share it, and we'll implement that. You know, but but that I, I also I also felt that if if we're pissing somebody off, then we're doing something right as well. So or at least uh, yeah, we could we could. Um, Keep, keep working on this on this project and uh, trying to trying to improve that model. But that was that was a lot of fun and actually getting into the whole art world and the art language and, and how they talk about these these pieces uh, was 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 very new. Um, finally, most most recently, uh, and this is the project that I was unfortunately I, I rudely had to reschedule this talk um, a few a few months ago and postpone it till today was because. Um, we had this new character that, that we uh, created for a British power company, EDF Energy. Uh, they wanted a mascot for their new ad campaign. Um, and so we, we, designed, we designed this character and are, are licensing it to them. And I had to go to Cape Town and, and London for, uh, for the, the, a, a few ad shoots. Uh, involving this character. And since they're, they're very new and they're turning out to be quite popular in, in the UK, I just wanted to show them to you, to you now.
electricity comes from low carbon generation. We can price promise. That's why we call it Blue Plus Price Promise. EDF Energy, feel better energy. That was ad number one. Nobody likes paying over the odds. So if we find another supplier is more than a pound a week cheaper, we'll actually tell you, and we won't charge your fee to leave. Blue Plus Price Promise for EDF Energy. Feel better energy. And finally, ad number three. EDF is an Olympic sponsor of this year. Dreams can come true. Tickets to London 2012 are just won thousands of awards up for grabs every month with thank yous from EDF Energy. Feel better energy. So from, from what I hear, and the, the Twitter streams are certainly uh, indicating that this is, this is doing great things for, for EDF's brand uh, in the UK. And so that's, that's really, really nice for us as well. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of what, what we've been working on. And uh, as I said, I moved to San Francisco a few months ago. And we've set up a little uh, studio and workshop up in um, Petro Hill. Well, we've got a uh, small but um, a nice little room where where uh, we're working on on new new designs and all the kind of paperwork around around <laughs> licenses and things like that. Um, I also am uh, kind of half uh, investor in this machine shop um, with a, uh, a Tormach. CNC mill, which is which is like the most exciting toy. Actually, we have a, an automatic tool changer now, and so I've been using that to uh, cut to cut metal and um, and and make some some new new mechanism designs. One of the one of the projects over the next few weeks is going to be I have a new a new character, which I would like to fabricate the skin myself uh, rather than than sending it off to to Japan. Uh, so, so I'm going to be making an aluminum mold here and, and going over to the tech shop and, and doing injection molding. And so I'm really, really looking forward to that. Uh, I said I'm a, I'm a half investor in all this stuff. Um, the company that I'm uh, co-located co with and, and renting the space from is uh, another robotics company called Bot and Dolly. And I just wanted to um, give them a, a little plug here. They're doing very, very cool work in... Uh, robotically controlled cinematography uh, and camera control. So they'll they'll take giant KUKA arms and put a put a red camera at the end and shoot advertisements, but also getting into uh, into some feature feature film work. And they have a very nice workflow from Maya uh, animation tools to the to the control of of these robots. This is kind of a sample of what they're doing. So it's uh, it's been really exciting to be sharing sharing a space with them and um, collaborating on on some projects uh, and and hope to to be doing a lot more and have have more to show you along those lines uh, at some point in the future. So that's that's all. I, I also wanted to um, invite anybody here to uh, to come up to visit our our shop in the city anytime. Be happy to to give you a little tour, and, um, and we're also looking to work with with uh, creative people in in robotics and character design, um, and and so please also reach out to me uh, in in that vein as well. And so with that, I'd like to just say thank you again for having me, and uh, certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I think. Questions. <laughs> uh, questions that have gone from sort of a basic level all the way.
landscape of home developer and advertiser in years. So pretty amazing. Yeah, two, two, three years, right. Pretty amazing. So where, where does, you've got lots of options, lots of things you can look at and do. I mean, you're showing us. Any, any, how, where does autism um, fit into this? Folks plan to return to that and maybe do some things in that field or are going to stay in the toy area, advertising area? Where does that lead? Well, yeah, like, like I said, we, um, one of, one of the really important things going into you know making a toy out of Keepon was uh, was it was critical to both Dr. Kozima and myself that that a project um, along those lines would need to support the the uh, original original work that Keepon came out of, and so um, we see it as kind of a way of um, taking taking something that is has cl clearly has some some popular appeal. Uh, and being able to harness the the excitement and enthusiasm of, of a general audience and direct it back to um, to you know more to, to the work that we actually care about <laughs> um, and and so whether that's uh, um, directly kind of funding funding the the manufacturing of a few research robots that we can give away or just being able to to get Get some tools and people and materials to do further development. Um, then, then we we think that that's a good a good way to uh, to to fund that kind of work. I mean, we're we're academics that uh, uh, just the two of us can't do those large scale studies that that I talked about. Um, but by being able to sell a hardware platform to other universities, as as we have, um, they're they're keep on pro versions in, uh, at Yale University, at, at some universities in Germany, the UK, uh, Disney Research Pittsburgh has a few of them, um, then, then we hope that a, a broader community of, of researchers can also uh, you know, use, use that hardware to, to, do, to do that good work as well. Um, so you know, I definitely, the, the kind of future design, um, future designs uh, that that we're working on do involve there. There is a component of of creating hardware that can be used in in those clinical settings. Um, whether whether or not I'm I'm personally involved in in the research, um, I, you know I don't I don't think matters matters too much. I, I'm I'm at this point interested in in designing things and building things and making them available to the people who are doing research to and and uh, and. All this, all this entertainment and advertising stuff is definitely making it, making it possible for me to do that. Yes. Uh, it is capable of autonomous motion. The the research robot is. Controlled from a from a computer, and so um, there there's lots of situations in which we we plug in some face detection or colorful object tracking, um, audio uh, you know perception. That yeah yeah so that that kind of the the dancing is certainly all a, a very kind of autonomous uh, layer of behavior, um, and and we can we so we can but we can do like face detection and tracking. The problem is that uh, the interactive richness of that ends up ends up wear, wearing thin after uh, a very short time. Whereas whereas in those clinical settings, when we're not that interested in the in in AI maybe, but in in an exploration of how this kind of form might be useful um, in in alleviating you know these children's perceptual difficulties. Um, and you know we'll do that until somebody somebody can can give us the tools uh, for for autonomy to achieve achieve those same kinds of ends. What will be a shame right now is is if you set it up to do automatic face detection and a child comes up and makes eye contact and something doesn't work and it turns away and then you've missed you've missed a, a potentially very nice opportunity to see something something happen there. So so that that's why we use teleoperation um, primarily in, in those settings. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In, I mean, interestingly, the the research robot uh, hasn't had touch sensors, but when we 
um, embarked on this toy project, we realized, okay, it doesn't have cameras, but uh, what other ways can we can we look can we understand uh, human you know activity around it? And certainly, tactile interaction is is uh, one of Keepon's kind of biggest magnetic um, you know attractions for children. And so it was it was obvious that that touch sensors on on the toy were uh, were a good thing to do. And that's definitely something that you know I think I think uh, future clinical platforms should should be including. Just just uh, quickly, uh, what are the sensors on the on the toy, and what are its modes of of, of reaction? Uh, so on the toy, there's um, a bunch of switches. There's switch on the top of the head, and then four around the body. Uh, and there are there's a, a behavioral state machine that that allows it to uh, give you give you a kind of range of different responses depending on how how often you do certain you know pat or poke it, um, and that that changes. So it's not just like you know you you hit it on the side. It does the that same the same thing all the time, like turning turning towards a poke. Um, there's a kind of tickling mode where if you're if you're touching it repeatedly, then it, then it's it's being tickled rather than rather than attending to the poke, right? So there's there's um, a few uh, a few responses that we that we built um, to to try to uh, make the kind of limited limited sensory input um, at least more more interesting. Does not have a microphone, and and yeah, and and the toy also has a microphone in the nose, and uh, in its dance mode, it is listening to music, um, and there's actually two kinds of uh, tempo detection that that are happening there. That there's it's actually uh, trying to look for some regular um, say amplitude peaks in in the audio that might represent a beat, and if those are not present or they're not regular. And it's doing something something different. Um, or kind of, you could think of it as a very dumb like Fourier uh, analysis on the on the audio to estimate a tempo and then pick a, a speed of dancing according according to that estimation. And then the follow up is is um, how does that gameplay uh, work out for kids in terms of I don't know, how what is the uptake? How how you know besides the the imagery is really amazing and on film, but when you sit down and you have 20 kids play with it, do they play with it today? Do they play with it so several days? Is it, you know, uh, you know, right? The, Christmas the, toys go away somehow. I, the, the the thing that I've learned in not just the the my grad school work, but also in my experience with this toy is that I I it's it's uh, impossible and unfair to make any sort of generalizations about children because in a group of 20 um, there's going to be uh, a handful that are completely uninterested. Um, there's going to be a handful that play with it for a little while, they think it's cute, and then once they, they, they kind of explore the whole range, they're like, okay, I get it, and then they go away. And then there are others that, um, like Maker Faire this past weekend, we had some toys out, and there were kids who would came and and sat there for 20 minutes, touching like really close, touching and and not even really doing anything specific, but just like being there with it and holding it. And the parents had to wrench them away. Um, and you know, I I can't not not having had enough experience with any of these children to say what like whether whether those those latter children might have had some some form of uh, developmental disability. I, you know, I, I don't know, but I see that that whole range of, of uh, behavior, and yeah, I think it's it's kind of an art to uh, to design something that is um, kind of overwhelmingly uh, positive or or attractive for a long period of time for children. I think I think very very few toys uh, uh, achieve that. Um, and you know, even the ones that become like the hit toys of the holiday season don't necessarily have that that kind of staying power, right? Like they'll like after a month, it's in the toy basket forever and and never brought out again. And so it and I, I I've had I've had a few months of experience like looking at the toy development process and looking at 
some of the pretesting we did, and then and then um, I certainly wish I had more experience with with real children playing with this toy that we produced, and I, and, and um, I don't. But but that's uh, yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> so the pretesting and development process and designing those that ring around there and those algorithms is that something you did on your own? Is that the toy company did that? What was the feedback loop? How did you guys come to to that level of, of what it ended up being? Yeah, the I mean the, the toy company approached us and, and presented a proposal for what what they they thought the toy could and should do. Um, in in working with them, we were um, you know very we we, we tried to to make sure that we had as much involvement in the process as possible, um, and and so you know I was I was actually they were they were uh, quite welcoming to me in in the development um, in like the some aspects of the mechanical development of certainly of the the software development um, much more so than they were used to dealing with your traditional licensor. Right, that that a lot of the a lot of a lot of the people at, at the toy company uh, were a bit surprised at how I guess <laughs> how much I knew about what they were doing and how how much uh, how opinionated I was about about various things. Um, and they might have initially been um, a bit turned off by that, but as as they realized that you know we're kind of all trying to trying to create something good together, um, they they ended up welcoming me that. Into into that process and um, yeah. One, one more question. One more question. Uh, what is the in the clinical setting? What does the therapist UI look like? I mean, all I saw was somebody clicking uh -huh. a few laptop keys. Right. And have you done any exploration in that in that whole area? Yeah. So um, that that design is kind of being iteratively. Um, it, it's it's changing it's changing all the time, but but. We're of course getting getting feedback from the therapists who are using it, and um, it started as kind of like you get you get the view, you've got a mouse and a keyboard, and you can do some stuff. But actually now there's uh, I I wish I had shown it, but um, there's a kind of panorama of the room that gets built in real time. So as you move the as you uh, as you make the robot turn to the right, the video kind of tiles this panorama, and you end up getting as the robot looks around the entire room, you get the you get the whole room, um, and then wherever it's currently looking, that's there. There's the real time kind of video update. But if I see because the therapist is also seeing a uh, a wall mounted camera of like the kind of the whole setting, and so if you see a child enter maybe from the door in that in that other setting, you can click on this panorama on the door because it's it's been populated there, and then keep on immediately saccades to that door. And that's a, a really kind of quick and efficient way of of uh, them them driving its attention. Right, and then and then and then you consider it actually, you know, basically either some kind of a joystick or something where movement is translated to movement rather than keystroke. Yeah, most of what we've done with the with with therapists is again with with the mouse for attention, and then there's uh, kind of hotkeys for. For like leaning or bouncing or even some longer kind of sequences of little canned um, expressions like no 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 or yes 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 and and those um, where they they you know we we teach them how to how to do that and they get comfortable with it um, actually I I end up uh, using a, a Wii remote controller a lot um, for um, especially if I need to be in the room with the children and I can't be like at, at a laptop then I'll have a uh, uh, the Wii remote in my hoodie pocket, and I can I can puppet. I'm watching the kids interacting with it, and I can puppeteer it right there. Um, yeah, that's 